welcome all i arvind giri welcome you all in today's session so just wanted to introduce nomad liberty movement the nomad liberty movement is a collective formed by the researcher lawyers professors uh, activists and social uh, workers from nt and dnt community to work on the issues of these nomadic tribes uh, and to, in 2020 so this year also we have we are celebrating a vimukta month from 16th august to 7th september the goal of the collective is to bring the issues of nomadic and unified tribes to the forefront to create a discourse in the mainstream in order to form a society based on the principles of liberty equality fraternity and justice today a uh, today we have uh, we have the second session that is on the topic colonial impact on pastoral nomads and caravan traders in india the raika and the banjara and the speaker is dr bikura bikura tor uh, post post doctoral research fellow human ecology department of anthropology university college of london uk i would like to introduce more about the uh, dr bikura uh, tor and his uh, work Dr. Biku uh, 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 Rathod, he has completed uh, uh, his doctoral degree from University uh, of Hyderabad on the thesis titled "Religion and Sustainable Conservation of Nature: The, th the Case of Bisnois of Rajasthan." He is trained in social cultural anthropology, specialized in environmental anthropology and research areas, history history of uh, nomadic people, mobile pastoralism. and conservation religion and ecology tribes of india indigenous knowledge historical anthropology in south asia he has been published several papers in international and uh, in international and national journals and edited book he has been delivered several invited talks at many international universities in uk europe and india he has he has also presented papers in several international conferences he is currently working on a book manuscript <laughs> on the raika of rajasthan mobile pastoralist in a changing world i welcome dr bikku rathod to deliver us a, a lecture and enlighten our all the participants about the various issues of nomadic and tribal tribes welcome sir uh, thank you very much uh, giri um, arvind giri for introducing me uh, briefly uh, i also thanks to dipali and uh, nomadic liberty movement for giving me this opportunity to to talk on nomadic community uh, i also congratulate to you all for 75th uh, independence day to uh, all the participants and my talk is on colonial impact on nomad nomads so mostly focusing on the raika pastoral community and the banjara uh, who were the farmer uh, caravan traders uh, nomad but now is settled so um, so i first um, when i started my research among the nomadic community i always um, a question always hunts me are these nomad and denote denotified communities denotified tribes have got freedom liberty and justice at least within this 75 years of independence but i have hardly seen uh, see the any changes like uh, uh, major changes which has uh, delivered liberty justice and freedom to the these communities because um, uh, these communities have uh, Uh, year by decade by decades after independence the uh, government and administrators have ignored and um, left as whatever the communities they can do they can uh, you know earn on various occupations any occupations so so the this has we can see this historical evidences uh, and the community experience shows that how this Uh, various colonial impact and pre-colonial impact has, uh, which was harshly treated, these 
communities and branded them as a criminals. So uh, criminalization of various nomads and other forest inhabited communities by the colonials, uh, colonizers were not only limited to India, but also other uh, colonies in the world. So uh, uh, Bernard Cohen, he has written, he has mentioned the, uh, and writing about effect of the colonial rules in American, African, and Asian countries. So the, uh, it also impacted uh, not only the nomadic community in India, but uh, other countries as well. The principal objective of the British colonialism was to increase its revenue by controlling people and its resources by introducing various laws which were made for their benefits. So my talk is mostly focuses on how the continuation of stigmatization of nomad of the nomads from the pre-colonial to colonial to post-colonial period. So I'll be attempting this point by showing a relationship between the livelihood and stigmatization using two the uh, above specific communities, case studies, which is Banjara and the Raika communities. So uh, if you see the nomads in the pre-colonial period was mostly on social stigma. So the so this, uh, criminalization was stigmatized, you know, a few communities even before the uh, colonial period. So uh, most of the, the social stigma on nomadic hill communities was already in practice in pre-colonial India. And many of these communities were considered as a robbers. Indian society was suspicious of the nomadic movement and their activities. Because as long as they go to the pre-colonial time, they were very suspicious se, aur bhot, सिविल सोसाइटी वो भी एक अलग तरीके से उनको ट्रीट करती थी कोई चोरों की तरह कोई इसकी तरह तो ये जो कलोनियल जो स्टिग्मा है वो प्री कलोनियल टाइम में भी था तो इसको देन दी मिडिवल नरेटिव्स ऑफ दिस पीपल हु इनहेबिटेड इन जंगल एंड हिल्स वर डिपिक्टेड अकेशनली एज रेडर ऑफ मुगल मराठा एंड राजपूत राजपूत क्योंकि इनको ये चोरों की तरह क्योंकि ये राजपूत मराठा जो किंग्स है उनका दरबार से यानी चोरी करने वाले उनके खेती से चोरी करने वाले इस तरीके से उनको ट्रीट किया जाता था इससे पहले uh early 60th century the communities such as gujar jat minas bhati mewatis bhils and many other communities were branded as a robbers to ye jo communities hai inko chorun ki tarah ghoshit kiya jata tha community so ye jyada tar north india ki isme tha so as per uh, uh, pre colonial rulers expected their administrative territory and some areas were restricted for grazing तो प्री कलोनियल टाइम में भी जो दो नोमैडी कम्युनिटीज है उनके ऊपर और पेस्टोरल कम्युनिटीज है जो घुमंतु जाती है जो भेड़ बकरी चराते हैं तो उनको भी एक थोड़ा रिस्ट्रिक्शन था किसके ऊपर जो उनके भेड़ बकरी चराने के लिए और उनको ग्रेजिंग के लिए वहां पर था लेकिन इतना स्ट्रिक्टली नहीं था तो uh they were able to these people able to uh convince and able to uh you know uh, make a deal with the local leaders and they able to uh negotiate and they able to use those grounds for grazing and used to continue their uh, traditional occupations so we can see these are uh, many communities are migrating from intermigration from the uh, what do you call the, the neighboring countries like afghanistan central asian regions uh, they were mostly pathan tribes who not only migrated for search of uh, 
uh, grazing areas, but also for work in agricultural field in a, um, a Punjab region. So, uh, Pakistan or India ke partition se pehle, jada tar jo border area ke hai, jo Rajasthan, Guj uh, Gujarat, or um, Punjab ke jo communities hai, jo nomadic communities hai, pastoral communities hai, unka movement bhot easy tha. Wo jate the, uh, Sindh area mein, dusre Pakistan ke region mein, Afghanistan ke lower part mein, aur wo jaake grazing karke wo wapas aa jate the seasonally. So, this was there for pastoral people for seasonal grazing and uh, uh, they able to manage some problem by giving bribe uh, with the local administrator and forest gods so uh, about the banjara community banjara community was traditionally uh, caravan traders jo ghumantu the jo unke bahel bail vagera caravan jo bullock cart ke upar unke जो सामग्री एक एक रीजन से दूसरे रीजन रीजन को ट्रांसपोर्ट करते थे तो उसको इरफान हबीब हैज मेंशन अबाउट द बंजारा कम्युनिटी वर वन ऑफ द मेजर इनलैंड ट्रांसपोर्ट ट्रांसपोर्टर कम्युनिटीज इन प्री कॉलोनियल इंडिया सो द एथनो हिस्ट्री ऑफ द बंजारा हैज ट्रेस्ड द अबो कनेक्शन टू द कैरवन ट्रेडर थ्रू लॉन्ग डिस्टेंस माइग्रेशंस क्योंकि बंजारा जो लॉन्ग डिस्टेंस माइग्रेशन करते थे साउथ से नॉर्थ नॉर्थ से पाकिस्तान रीजन और डिफरेंट एरियाज में उनका कनेक्शन था तो वो महीनों महीनों वो ट्रैवल करते थे एक जगह से दूसरी जगह पर अलॉन्ग विथ थाउजेंड्स ऑफ थाउजेंड्स ऑफ एनिमल्स सो दे वर ट्रेडर्स एज एज वेल एज दैस्टोलिस्ट ऑल्सो so banjara uh, was banjaras uh, were leading supplier of roots to mughal army maratha kingdom nizam of hyderabad for more extended period as satya mentioned in his writing that banjara monopolized both trade and the knowledge of trade routes in india and armies also moved along with the trade routes therefore they used the banjara as a route route assistance so banjara were also uh, they were also well connected with the different market places they used to buy and sell various goods in weekly monthly market in various places so the banjara had a good trade relationship with various religious centers kyunki us samay par zyada tar religious center ko bhi center mana jata tha even trade aur religion jaise varanasi hai वहां पर रिलीजियस सेंटर भी है और ट्रेडिंग के लिए भी वो एक जगह पर माना जाता था जो साउथ इंडिया में तिरुपति तिरुपति और दूसरी जगह पर उनको माना जाता था तो वो वेल कनेक्टेड थे जैसे रिलीजियस सेंटर्स के लिए भी तो उनका कनेक्शन एक्सपेंडेड अक्रॉस द सब कॉन्टिनेंट अब प्री कलोनियल इंडिया में even uh, raika pastoralist they were able to move to pakistan and uh, even uh, various areas and they used to graze their animals and used to come back so this freedom was there in pre british period although there was uh, social stigma prevailing among the few communities so uh, what happened uh, nomads under the colonial rule so british india has imposed the colonial policies and acts on nomad and other indigenous communities activities and movements of the nomadic communities including banjara and the raika slowly started declining during east india company and later in the british raj they mainly introduced the criminal tribal act of 1871 and the indian forest act of 1878 because these two जो क्रिमिनल ट्राइबल एक्ट है और फॉरेस्ट एक्ट है 1878 का जो ये दो जो मेन मेजर इंपॉर्टेंट है जो लॉ वो जो नोमैडिक कम्युनिटीज को इफेक्ट किया गया है स्पेशली पेस्ट्रोलिस्ट एंड अदर नोमैडिक ट्राइबल कम्युनिटीज और इनको ही नहीं जो हंटर गैदरर्स है और अदर फॉरेस्ट डिपेंडेंट है जो फॉरेस्ट सेटलर्स है उनको उनकी उनके लिए भी बहुत कठिन हो गया था तो 
So British administration controlled forest resources by giving complete power to the forest officers to control the migration and pastoral, pastoralist herds. So pastoral, uh, forest officers and the police had right to seize the cattle from the um, pastoralist under the Cattle Trespass Act of 1871. So, the Criminal Tribal Act, hai, Forest Act, hai, aur, uh, Cattle Trespass Act 1871. This is the which has uh, affected the, these uh, nomadic communities very, very, very hardly. So, in order to expand the colonial control, Indian Forest Act 1870 was amended. So over the period of time, it was amended and 1920, 1927, the Indian Forest Right Act, which was which helped the uh, colonial government to generate and enhance revenue systematically. So uh, in the process, millions of trees were cut down for railways and other uses and resources systematically were being exploited for the commercial and industrial purposes. So, uh, the, the other major reason for the, uh, to establish the colonial, uh, British colonialism in India was um, the official colonial anthropological knowledge, which was uh, uh, made available in a gazetteers, series of caste and tribe volumes, and census report and other records. Because uh, uh, Britishers go records ke through जो कितने लोग हैं क्या काम करते हैं और कितना पापुलेशन क्या-क्या काम करते हैं उनका वेल्थ और उनका इनकम ये सभी जो है ना ये रिपोर्ट की तरह उनके पास दर्ज था तो उसकी तरह से ये जो रिपोर्ट्स है सेंसस रिपोर्ट है और ये जो गजिटर्स है उनको बहुत आसानी हो गया कि कम्युनिटीज को कैसे पेनलाइज करने के लिए यानी कि कैसे उनको colonized or systematically kaise unko divide karke aur kaise different laws ko formulate karne ke liye aur kaise different social categories ko divide karne ke liye unko ek ek bahut bada jo hai na ye census report aur ye jo unke haath mein tha uh fair the um Christopher Penny the professor of uh, professor of anthropology at UCL he observed that and Anthropometric records and the official theories on the caste helped the colonials to classify Indian people. So, this colonial knowledge provided to uh, grounds for the colonial rulers to make a distinct uh, presentation of socio-economic, cultural, and political life of the people of India. In this scheme, uh, pastoralist and nomad people and indigenous communities emerged as a distinct category. Nomads and indigenous peoples and their lifestyles were often projected stereotype. Although mobile pastoralists in tra uh, traditional substance practices, they were often seen as a responsible for environmental degradation and declining in the size of wildlife population. Because the amount of movement ko ek se forest ko effect यानी कि फॉरेस्ट को एक्सप्लाइटेशन फॉरेस्ट यानी कि एक्सप्लाइटेशन करने वाले इस तरीके से उनको ट्रीट किया गया था जो नोमैडिक कम्युनिटीज को और पैशनल कम्युनिटीज को विद द सपोर्ट ऑफ डिफरेंट प्रिंसली स्टेट्स एंड इंडियन एलिट्स क्योंकि ब्रिटिशर्स को अकेले वो आके डायरेक्टली उनका जो है ना रूल एस्टैब्लिश नहीं किया गया क्योंकि उनको बहुत सारे जो छोटे-छोटे राजा थे जो प्रिंसली स्टेट से वो और इंडियन एलिट से इंडिया में जो रिच लोग थे वो सभी जो है ना उनको सपोर्ट किया गया और दे वर प्रोवाइडेड द इनपुट्स अबाउट द कम्युनिटीज टू द ब्रिटिशर्स एंड दे एबल टू रूल प्रॉपर्ली एंड सिस्टमेटिकली ऑल्दो वी हैव अ डिफरेंट कम्युनिटीज and different uh, cultures, but uh, they were able to control us very systematically for uh, centuries. So, uh, for example, the, the new political uh, relationship of Nexus 
nexus of power between the British colonial regime and princely state impose severe limitations on uh, hunting gathering, nomadic activities, and sifting cultivations. So various Indian actors involved in reproducing indigenous source for the colonialist I helped which, which it was helped to formulate strict laws and systematic subjugation, uh, various nomadic and indigenous people. So they were able to uh, receive, they able to get some inputs from these community, these people, elite people and the uh, colonial, uh, what do you call this, um, princely states. So they able to formulate the uh, Criminal Tribal Act in 1871, which was first notified as many as 150 caste or communities, such as a hereditary criminals. So, in 1871, may jada tar takriban 150 communities ko uh, hereditary uh, criminals bataya gaye the, aur inko forcefully settled and kept them under police surveillance. तो उनको पुलिस की निगाह पर उनको रखा गया था क्योंकि उनको ये जन्म से ही ये चोर की तरह है तो हेरिडेटरी क्रिमिनल्स तो उनको इस तरीके से बहुत सारे नोमेडिक नोमेडिक कम्युनिटीज को ऐसे किया गया था ट्रीट किया गया था और स्लोली इट वाज एडेड फ्यू कम्युनिटीज लेटर एंड ब्रांडेड देम एज क्रिमिनल्स सो एक on the basis of one or two acts, one or two um, uh, thefts, the, they able to brand the community, whole community as a criminals. So this was uh, expanded. First, it was uh, uh, implemented in a Northwest provinces, Punjab and over. It become later administrative region, which was, uh, uh, Criminal Tribal Act 1870 was implemented. And later, it was expanded to across the entire country through giving more power to the uh, local uh, provinces to identify communities as a criminals and restrict their movements. So they were uh, given uh, authorities. They were given uh, permissions. They were given order to the local people. Uh, I mean, local rulers. I mean. Uh, princely states, they can identify uh, communities which were indulging in such activities and uh, brand them as a criminal tribes, yeah, I mean, criminal communities. So uh, this act provided for establishing reform schools, settlements for the refor uh, reformation uh, of these people. Under the colonial act, the police used to arrest people belonging to nomadic and indigenous community without a warrant. So, ये क्या किया गया था? उनको एक अधिकार था कि बिना वारेंट के भी किसी कम्युनिटीज को किसी इसको किसी कम्युनिटीज को आप अरेस्ट कर सकते हैं किसी व्यक्ति को जो नोमैडी कम्युनिटी के व्यक्ति है उसको अरेस्ट कर सकते थे तो इस तरीके से जो नोमैडी कम्युनिटीज को उसको पीनलाइज करके उनको जो है ना punished kiya gaya hai. So uh, during uh, 19th century, uh, second half of 19th century, when Indian railway was uh, started to connect with major trade routes, the Banjara caravan traders uh, were slowly started declining because they were used to transport uh, the major goods on their bullock carts or um, bull. But what happened when these major routes were connected, railway were connected, the slowly the Banjara occupations were declined. So slowly it was declining. So a decade after of uh, Criminal Tribal Act came into force, the Banjara were included in the list of criminal tribal tribes in North India. It was first in the North India. And later it was uh, this Criminal Tribal Act was implemented in uh, 1911 in Madras presidency. So in South India, it was later. So the British monopolized trade, economic market in India through a systematic destruction of handloom, small scale industries, petty traders, and control over nomadic activities such as pastoralism, art, and craft. So 
many grievances of nomadic people were deliberately neglected and sidelined by the state. They were denied their traditional freedom of movement, customary practices. As a result, the nomadic community became vulnerable and marginalized. So, uh, one side, this administrative uh, uh, separation and uh, administrative impact. The other side was, we can say the the natural or uh, we can say the uh, famines, which was hit across in 1898 and uh, 99 across India and several million people died of hunger and disease. So including mobile pastoralists, traders from whom thousands of animals were lost. So through, uh, through the nomadic way of life, mobile pastoralists were able to escape various disease brought in, in the region and able to uh, migrate to feasible places. But due to strict colonial policies, numerous nomadic people, including Banjara, were forced to take a sedentary lifestyle, struggle to find their alternative livelihood. And in the process, they were severely affected by the uh, famine and drought. So uh, this famine was 1898 and 99 had affected even Raika communities. And they were lost not only their animals, but also several people of their community in the severe famine. So as Satya, he mentioned in his writing, between 1891 to 1911, the Banjara population had uh, quite distinctly declined uh, throughout the barrel. So he has mentioned that there were about 40% of uh, the reason people, Banjara people were, were missing in the records because whether these people have died or they migrated to other place. So this is uh, uh, not mentioned anywhere. So the reason of this decline, the Banjara population were not clear. So still, uh, the British policy and drought, which is Banjara could not face due to above policies, which deprived them their livelihood and did not provide any substances. So the torture of British fight against the British and native rulers cannot be ignored for the decline in the population. So whereas the Raikas, uh, when it was with the people, uh, Raika pastoralist people, they, they recall the, uh, that uh, a famine was, which was 18, uh, which was affected in the 1898 and 1999. So this was, they called as a call in Rajasthani. So which is uh, in which their family along with the several other families of the village, so Raika people, they have lost their families along with the other family, thousands of sheep and number of camels have, they have lost during this Chapanyaka. So what happened? Uh, a post-independent period. So although there was a uh, uh, criminal tribal act was finally repealed in 1952 uh, by newly independent India, and communities caste were notified, uh, which were notified as a criminal during colonial period were denotified. So uh, according to Idade Commission report of 2017, uh, present DNTs and T's population as many as 150 millions. So um, although the CTA was replaced with uh, the CTA, the Criminal Tribal Act was replaced with the Habitual Offender Act of 1952 in India. But this was not implemented by the many state, um, by the uh, all the state, but few states have been implemented this Habitual Offender Act. So uh, these nomadic people were already in trouble and had struggled to survive under the Criminal Tribal Act and Forest Act during the British regime. Further, the post-independent India the Habitual Offender Act created 
more are similar situation and control nomadic people and their activities. According to the Renke Commission report of 2008, people belongs to denotified tribes were viewed as suspicious by the police and the people. So independent Indian state denied the civil rights, such as domicile rights to several nomadic communities for the decades. After six decades of the Indian independent, we can see uh, the Forest Right Act, which was in 2006. Earlier, what happened, the, even the Forest Act also, which was colonial Forest Act during the British period, the same act were implemented the post during the post-independent India with the slight modification. Uh, they, were, they, have, they were given some rights to the um, uh, forest dependent communities, but uh, officials, forest officials and other officials uh, keep on denying the rights and not allowed these communities to, not much allowed to these communities to uh, use those resources, forest resources. But in, after six decades, of Indian independent government of India, finally, they have um, implemented, uh, I mean, uh, enacted this act in 2006. But uh, there is a, like, there is a problem in uh, implementation, I think, uh, because when I was uh, with the Raika communities in the Kumbhalgarh forest area in Mewar region, the grazing resources uh, were not allowed by these communities uh, because although they have these uh, forest right act, but they completely, um, most of the time they were denied to use those forest areas for their grazing purposes. So colonial stigma attached with the Raika pastoral community is continuing even today. If you see uh, the Raika pastoralist uh, in the region, in the Rajasthan, uh, because they are traditional nomad and camel breeders, shepherds, and non raika and other community, they view them as a wanderers, I mean, ghost, like in Hindi, bhoot, uh, kinki ye log, raat din jungle mein rehte, aur idhar ghoomte rehte, jungle mein rehte, aur bheed bakri charate, to unko aise, isi tarikhe se, boh saare log inko treat ki, ki aajate, abhi bhi. So uh, forest department, uh, forest department of, after independence, India, they, uh, they started uh, restricting these communities uh, to graze those grazing lands, grazing areas in the forest, in the forest. So um, what happened to Banjaras after independence? So uh, pre, uh, during British time only, these communities were able, they were, forcefully settled and forcefully they settled and put on surveillance. And what happened? The traditional occupation was lost. Along with traditional occupation, they also lost their skills, knowledge, which was acquired over the generations. In the given circumstances, the Banjara have adopted various available occupations. So whatever jo, jo kaam milta tha, wo kaam karna suru kar traditional occupation hai, jo, uh, caravan trading ka tha, jo, uh, gumantu ka jo kaam tha, wo kaam chud gaya unka. Toh, uh, they have started, some Banjaras were started as a bonded laborers in agriculture field and uh, local landlords and upper caste uh, people, they use the uh, different different calculation and deliberately they make more interest on their loan, which were taken in uh, taken during their work. And um, either they able to continue for longer period as a bonded laborer. And um, people were like treated very, very cheap labels and Banjara were struggling to migrate to cities and other places. Uh, working, working as a labor in a construction, agricultural labor. So various cities and towns. 
and some of them are seasonally engaged in sugarcane transportation if you see in the telangana most of the region in a uh, in a sangareddy district and other areas most of the lamara tribes they seasonally uh, move to the sugarcane works with their families and living in a agriculture areas and very pathetically they were given very low uh, wage and other things so these are uh, activities now which were uh, what you call these communities were self sufficient and uh, self reliance uh, during um, their traditional occupation but now they were become the mostly vulnerable kind of things and when it's come to the raika raika have almost lost their occupations a uh, one third of them have left their traditional occupation and at least now 20 to 25% of population are able to continue their traditional occupations as a um, pastoralist and others are uh, working in a agriculture field and migrating to other areas as a shopkeeper and other jobs so uh, i will conclude here um, the colonial and post colonial policies changed the lifestyle and cultural economy of several nomadic communities by imposing restrictions on their movement and activities like several other nomadic communities the raika and banjaras have forced to adapt to the sedentary lifestyle resulted in decline in their traditional livelihood in the process almost uh, as i mentioned the uh, one third of the uh, three quarter of the raika population have uh, abandoned their traditional occupations uh, and uh, choosing the different employment uh, it is established fact that banjara lost their traditional occupations of caravan trading and forced to adopt sedentary lifestyle under the british rule under the criminal tribal act so uh, discrimination against nomadic and forcible settled communities have been continued for the centuries even in the independent several suggestions and recommendation have made by the scholars in in general and commission including uh, renke commission idate commission to address the issue related to denotified tribe semi nomadic and uh, uh, nomadic communities these commissions suggestions to the government to bring awareness among the people of, people of india regarding the lifestyle their lifestyle and cultures however the central and state government have been very slow in addressing the issues of denotified say uh, denotified semi nomadic and nomadic communities the indian state had indian state has neglected these communities for decades as a result they were economically socially deprived and marginalized they have been neglected both colonial and post colonial states have failed to understand the sustainable practices of the nomadic culture and their livelihood instead they try to control and uh, the nomadic mobility and their activities for centuries and decades the top down approach used for administrating and controlling the nomadic people by the post independent india and its federal states which is states has failed to provide justice to them so i'll stop here thank you thank you dr bikur atol yeah and i think it was really in insightful uh, session yeah as like you rightly pointed out that though this is like 75 india has completed yesterday on before two days back only the 75 years of independence but still the uh, there is question on the independence of nomadic and nomadic tribes there is question about identity of nomadic and nomadic tribe tribes and yes rather you said that the states they are slow rather i uh, i will say that states are not ever like uh, caring about these nomadic uh, and nomadic tribes rather they are not even understanding them as human so basic their identity so implementation is a uh, implementation of various policies or making policies that is uh, as larger policy level question uh, existed 
it for all of these nomadic and river tribes. Uh, I would request the uh, participants to unmute whosoever like wanted to ask the questions to Dr. Bikurato, unmute themselves or otherwise put their questions in chat box and we can take one by one. Otherwise, I have a few questions in the lineup I can ask. Uh, please unmute yourself, no, so, so that you can directly ask the questions. I have a question. Yes, yes, uh, So, uh, Dr. Thar, uh, thank you for this uh, insightful, I think, of framework you have given to look at that, how uh, indigenous communities' uh, life has been affected by the pre- or post-colonial uh, activities, I should say that. So, uh, do you think that it is a, a common framework for all kind of uh, 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 um, section of population or communities in India, or it has uh, uh, particularly uh, with this uh, nomads and I should say that uh, uh, nomad and uh, other tribal groups? Because I'm uh, uh, I'm uh, from Bihar and I'm working on a Pasi community. Actually, it is a scheduled caste community. And I am also trying to uh, find uh, its historical journey that how it has evolved uh, with the time. So uh, it got stuck that uh, should I you uh, what kind of framework should I actually look uh, to actually trace the origin of uh, my community as well. So that's my question. Uh, if anybody has yeah you can ask yeah if nobody has question right now yes. So one by one, I'll answer. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think um, when Britishers uh, arrived in India, so they were uh, formulated frame, I mean, they were used after understanding the communities, they, they use a different framework for the different communities actually. Whereas the uh, nomadic communities and um, uh, forest dwellers, which were like uh, forest, uh, forest dependent communities like tribes and other communities were, were, were in the focus because these communities were uh, revolted against the, the uh, framework, I mean their rules, because the nomadic communities were moving as usual every year and decades, and this was occupation for generation to them. And suddenly they will come up, come up with the Criminal Tribal Act or Forest Act, and uh, suddenly they stop this community, uh, their activities and their movement. Then they will react because we were, they say that like we, we have been moving, we have been doing these activities for centuries together and who are you to stop us? So they question them that why you got this kind of, uh, you know, act and uh, kind of things, which is not available before. And we were happily moving one place to another place. And though there were uh, slight uh, restrictions with the local, uh, kings and uh, rulers, but they able to negotiate with them. But suddenly when they uh, got this kind of, you know, criminalization and the uh, restrictions on their movement. So these people forest, uh, even uh, because I mentioned that one, the forest uh, dependent communities, the tribal communities also, uh, few of them were branded as a criminals because they, they, they were, uh, they were doing terrace cultivation, they were doing the shifting cultivation and that was affecting, uh, that was uh, um, uh, considered as a affecting to the uh, a, a degradation to the forest because Britishers for them, this forest resources was very important because they, were, they already exploited uh, the resources, uh, uh, forest resources in their homeland in England. So that, that was, uh, they were looking for the good resources area, forest area, and India was the best for them. And uh, when they were introducing these policies, obviously these communities were reacted to them and uh, they were able to, um, they able to again penalize these communities. So the treatment of these communities were different 
than the other community because other communities were uh, living in a um, towns and villages that was um, their treatment was on the land tenure and other things but whereas the nomadic communities were the complete restriction of their occupation so so that was uh, I, I think this was different uh, framework they have used for the different communities and um, I I don't know how how to suggest you. I think uh, you look your um, areas like the scheduled caste communities means like you can look uh, if you do more research and more reading. I think uh, you'll find the framework. Uh, what kind of framework you can use? Uh, whether this where I am using my framework or uh, similar framework on tribals and. Uh, um, a nomadic community which, which I am using, like the similar framework you can use or not, I am not like um, expert on that. But you can, uh, if you are keep on reading on this uh, literature, I think obviously you will find out those things. And you can apply this one as well, uh, some extent, but uh, uh, on the basis of the community's occupations and other things, I mean, you can, uh, you can go ahead all the best for your research. Thank you. Yeah, any other? Anybody have any question? Okay, I will ask. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Vika, how do you see the like, uh, how you differentiate between the communities and tribe? That is my first question. And second question, so generally, there is a big debate that uh, nomadic tribes are whether they are tribes and how they are like deeper from the scheduled tribes. So you are insight on that. Um, thank you. Very um, <laughs> critical question you asked. <laughs> so I think. Um, um, the tribe which was uh, given by the, uh, the the name given by the others so certain communities was declared as a tribes so communities were declared as a tribe so there is a the tribe when it's come to the uh, when you say the tribe there, there is a completely uh, there is al already involvement of community so i think um, um, both are interdependent, I can say, but whereas communities, certain communities may not be tribe. Okay. But tribes are obviously the community. So I think this is tricky, Kuncher. I, I, I may not, I mean, I might not do justice by saying these things, but um, this I can say. So uh, when the nomadic communities, uh, how we can differentiate from nomadic communities to settled tribes? You, you, your question, right? So, um, see, uh, if you see these um, commissions, they have already listed the communities, you know, the nomadic and denotified tribes. They, so, these communities are uh, declared. Uh, some communities are declared as scheduled tribes. Some communities are declared as a SC. Some communities are de declared as a OBCs. So, so different states have uh, declared as a different uh, categorization. So, scheduled tribe is a is a, uh, is a you know official you can say recognized uh, uh, term for the communities uh, those who are living in a uh, forest areas. So uh, some of the nomadic communities also uh, uh, consider as a set of tribes. Example, uh, some of the communities in um, Jammu and Kashmir, they were considered as a tribe, set of tribes. So it differs from the states to states. So uh, example, the Banjara community, which is Lambada, which now is a set, uh, I mean, uh, in 1967, declared as a scheduled tribe. So earlier they were like, uh, they also come under the nomadic communities in the list. So semi-nomadic community list. So, so these are the um, 
we can say the playing with the officials uh, recognition i think yeah thank you thank you dr bikra i think we have two questions few questions in chat box one like from rajesh nomadic communities face spatial as well as linguistic challenge as they could not own village citizenship and common popular language as a mainstream population can you elaborate how this challenge can be removed yeah um, thank you rajesh um communities yeah sala mandal maaje kaam hai maaje kaam hai communities has the uh, different languages they speak a different language because they live in a uh, a group a ghetto a community and moving the same community will be moving from one place to another place so uh, they the few communities were settled but uh, few communities were uh, few nomadic communities were settled forcefully settled uh, by the uh, government pre colonial uh, colonial period and post colonial period as well so these communities were uh, you know given the area the house area which is like periphery of the village so and uh, that kind of treatment also like community or the different communities also they view they look them differently very uh, you know uh, suspicious kind of things yeah that's how when when uh, indian government wanted to uh, uh, you know settle these few communities in different states uh, they were they were able to able to mix with the different caste and different community groups but uh, that's a problem with the implementation i think yeah so uh, yeah, obviously there is a linguistic challenges uh, for the communities because uh, the mainstream language is different that's how the the, the different kind of uh, treatments by the police by the locals and by the even administrators because they they they, they are not, they were not able to understand they are not able to understand they what actually they want to convey this nomadic communities are so this kind of difficulties are there so what uh, uh what can we do for this challenges i think uh, first we need to change the mindset of the people the equality is important what dr b r ambedkar was said i mean we need to um, treat equally to neighbors and who is uh, fellow beings so that mindset the, the the psychological change the mindset should be changed and that should forcefully uh, come with the come by the force with the uh, government so government also need to so there are there are the acts which was equality everyone equal before law so but equality is there justice is there but but i think uh, the problem with the implementation and uh, even with the other community other people because who is the government government is the, the people right so we need to understand the different various communities should understand so this nomadic communities and other communities and different languages people are part of our you know society and we are equal so that need to be uh, considered i think that thing i can say <laughs> not more than that thank you uh, we have another question from himraj arvin uh, we have uh first question from anuja agarwal i think she she put it you can just check before rajesh yeah yeah sorry i just missed yeah. it so uh, thank dipali so uh anuja's question is uh, about how the changes in livelihood of communities such as banjars impacted their community life can we see them as cohesive communities with a strong sense of identity or are they heterogeneous and fragmented Secondly, do you think there is a 
resurgence of these identities due to successive commission being set up and the polit politicization of the issues um all the changes in the life of it so um i think uh, banjaras uh, they lost their occupation if if we go to the historical roots um banjaras have they have lost their occupation uh much before the other nomadic communities what can we say in the because their occupation was the mostly trading kind of things and transportation so when the uh train routes were connected and trains were introduced transport for the transportation the, the slowly their occupation will decline so what they have done was like uh during uh, british period itself they have started uh, adapting the new occupations are settling are uh, doing some other occupations and they also started um, i mean they also continued their pastoral activities in some regions but they also started the uh, cultivations so they started learning with the other communities and um, slowly uh, their settlements if you see the banjara settlements in um, south india mostly they are close to the village like 2 3 km away from the village like main village so their settlements their uh, hamlets we can see these kind of things so so slowly uh, i think uh, these communities was i mean uh, started uh, picking up of other occupations and um, they able to uh, grasp grass compared to other communities very fast so um yes uh, they are a strong uh, identity as a community but they are uh, uh, heterogeneous because in south india the banjaras are uh, doing other occupations and uh, banjaras language is different than the north india even madhya pradesh uh, gujarat rajasthan they speak uh, the language differently and um, south india only this deccan region communities they speak uh, the similar language but there is again dialectical differences we can say so um uh, i can say these communities are um, identify as a homogeneous but like as well as the heterogeneous when we see this uh, 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 different state level but uh, we can say these uh, communities in a state level uh, i mean they are homogeneous kind of things uh, and um, this identity to successive commissions in this sort of politicizations not issues uh i uh, i can't say the the last one so thank you so there is another question from himraj uh women from some dnt community engage in sex work they are stigmatized due to multiple identities like occupational identity caste identity and dnt identity and obvious gender identity so the question uh, is what should be the framework to research on such vulnerable women so i think um uh, we are when you are talking about the dnt communities uh, obviously we i mean more uh, women women were more uh, marginalized than the men within the community so yes we can say um because women are more vulnerable um men's were like when they were moving from one place to another when they were having the traditional occupation they were they were at one place all uh, the occupations were divided among the uh, family within the family and they able to uh, do their work in a systematic manner but like what happened when 
this fluctuation, the uh, forced settlement happened with these communities and uh, stigmatization and they were uh, moving not a long distance, but uh, short distance areas. And um, yes, you can say the few, few people were, might have engaged in such activities. And, um, but this, this, we cannot say this, uh, th there's a, uh, that's how this, you know, civil, uh, others, I mean, society, other people, they brand them as a, you know, this community, whole communities as a, you know, doing same work, like sex work, sexual workers and uh, all kind of things, but like, uh, but not uh, case with the, all the, the whole community are the, all the nomadic people. And obviously, um, I think uh, we need to uh, focus on the not only the 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 whole community, but like within the community, we can focus on the um, gender issue. It's very important, very sensitive. Gender issue is very sensitive. It's twelve hours. Yeah. So we need to focus on this one, and um, I don't. I don't know like what framework we can use, but like, um, yeah, these are these uh, communities were suppressed uh, even uh, even today. So uh, they need to be, you know, immediate uh, focus either by the researchers. We need to we need to focus on the communities' gender issues and. There should be a, there should be a, a, a special uh, commissions. I think uh, special. Even we have commissions, but like even special categories in a district wise or state wise, we should, you know, rec uh, we should. I mean, there should be a special committees which are looking for looking after these ac ac aspects, especially the human right act, uh, human right commissions. District level should be needed. Or whether these communities were concentrated in areas where uh, more populations are there, there should be, I mean, a proper uh, government need to be take care of these kind of things. So after all, we are researchers, we can do, we can publish, but uh, not many changes will, you know, occur with us, but at least we can report these things. But uh, obviously the, uh, the community and the state need to Focus on this one, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Deepali, uh, are there any questions on YouTube? Uh, no, I, no, no. Okay, People so. People are live, uh, yeah, they are, they're watching, but uh, I can't see any question. Okay, me too. Uh, I have a last question. What are the like, uh, uh, what are the few or the your suggestions or your advice to implement specifically in the field of livelihood and sustainability related to the nomadic and nomad tribes at uh, by the center or the state government to make them more sustainable or uh, to bring them uh, uh, providing them the sustainable livelihood opportunity in present context You are, you are mute. mute. The, Unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Now, I think uh, uh, more uh, what we need to, I mean, what government need to do is like uh, review their uh, re uh, more focus on their traditional occupations and uh, give them more opportunity to re, you know, re collect their. Uh, I mean. Um, Example, the pastoral communities are very expert, traditional expert on their pastoral community, pastoral occupation. If you provide them resources and provide them 
<coughs> grazing areas and other things. And then they, they are able to pick up very easily. There are artisans communities. There are other uh, occupation communities are there. I mean, we need to encourage their traditional occupations because uh, the, the whole family can depend on that one. So first need to be educate them and uh, mm, through education, it, they can enhance their occupational things, you know. The artists, the, the artisans, they can enhance their occupation with the, you know, oh, what modern uh, things are coming up now. So education also very important. And uh, example now, uh, when I was working among the uh, Raika communities, I asked a few people, younger generation people, they said that, uh, I mean, after finishing my education, I want to, some of them, they are saying like, I want to go for a like uh, um, sheep farming. So there are not much grazing areas, no, but like they want, they want to go for a sheep farming. So, I mean, government has to increase them and give a training, give a suggestions and give a resources. I mean, they will, they, they can, you know, um, that, that is the sustainable livelihood, I can say that one. So whatever occupations were there, example, these communities, many nomadic communities are very expert in uh, nomadic occupation, are traditional occupations. Uh, still, some of the member of these communities are still uh, into those occupations. But the, I mean, if you encourage to them, I mean, this is uh, additional gen uh, generating employment kind of things, I think. These are the things, sir. And we should not ignore the education. Education is very important for this community. Even nomadic communities are also there, but like there should be like, I, I have gone through some of the writings and some places like even the nomadic schools are uh, running, you know? So why can't uh, we can, uh, you know, go for a nomadic schools? I mean, schools are, uh, along with the communities where they are moving. Example, the sugarcane workers, I have seen here in um, Telangana, South India. So there are the, these Banjara tribes, the Lambadas, they are sugarcane uh, uh, workers. So seasonally they will migrate along with their children. So we can't, uh, they, most of the children, like some of them, they, they drop, out, drop out from the schools and they are doing that occupations. So education, if we, if there are like seasonal mobile schools, mobile teachers, then that will be helpful for these communities. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Doctor. Then I have a question if nobody has any now. Uh, Adi Pali, please. Yes. So, so, so uh, Dr. Arthur, thank you so much for your insightful uh, uh, session, I would like to ask, uh, we have witnessed like the nomadic and denotified communities have witnessed several commissions and committees and uh, the reports have been submitted uh, to the government. No, if we see there are more than 20 committees or uh, four national commissions has been set up by the government, but, uh, uh, but uh, the recommendations has not been implemented by the government yet. So what do you think, uh, is it because of the mindset of the people who are sitting there in the administration that they don't want to implement anything for uh, these NTDNDs? Or is it because the many reports which have been submitted over the period of time have created some confusion uh, uh, like about the identity of these communities that like one of the major narratives which we can heard every time that uh, these communities are very diverse they uh, they have their no own culture and because of that uh, government is not able to implement uh, some unique policies for them so this is the major narratives which are which we can heard all the time that they are very diverse and uh, they have their unique uh, way of living and because of that uh, they are not able to get uh, any uh, uh, benefit of the development programs but but uh, at the same time uh, i can also see that it is also the uh, inability or we can say uh, uh, 
uh, yes, uh, we can say the prejudiced mindset of the administrative people that they do they really don't want it to implement or uh, reach to these uh, communities. So, uh, is it like we need to uh, as a NTDNTs as a whole, we need to represent or we need to present ourselves um, uh, in, uh, I think, Lok Sabha or Vidhan Sabha to, no? uh, to, to, to raise our voices. So, so what, what do you think about that? Because, because ultimately it's the policy which, uh, which, which is going to no? benefit people. So, so what is your opinion on it? Um, this is a very right question you asked. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, presenting in a Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha raising this question is is very important, and it should be done. I mean, immediately. I mean, coming years. I mean, coming days or years, you can say. Uh, I think there is a, like um, what I see was that uh, uh, it is not. The you know administrator won't don't want to implement these policies, but I think uh, there is a last of continuity. I think whatever the reports are uh, reports are submitted, or uh, you know policies were made, but I think uh, the implementation and the continuation of these issues were uh, delayed. I think neglected year by year. Yeah, obviously this community is diverse and um, different languages, different states, and they were not in a one, some communities are not in one place and uh, they don't have this even other cards and not uh, domicile, uh, you know, records are not settled in a proper way, proper areas, but like, but uh, why can't we, make a special the the ministry which is like denotified ministry which is nomadic you know and the, in the name of nomad communities so that only that ministry can look after this uh, aspect and continue those reports and records and uh, continue uh, to implement these policies and pressurize the um, bureaucrats and other people to continue and to uh, implement effectively among these communities. And more thing is like communities are now, uh, few communities are habituated in, uh, you know, moving one place to another place. That is their part of their culture. So policies should make in a way that they can continue their habit, way, uh, their uh, habit which is like, you know, culture, which is moving from one place to another place, as well as they can earn their money with respect, huh? and other people should respect them, like, uh, not respect, like, at least treat them equally, you know. So, I think, I think right policy and right implementation is needed. So, uh, and the, whatever reports are coming, and the showing these are the difficulties or <clears throat> these are the problems among these communities. It should be addressed immediately and it should be, you know, uh, effectively it should be implemented and this should be forced with, uh, the, the government has to force this one to implement effectively. Why can't they, they work, you know, they can work right. So, uh, there should be a, you know, uh, the continuity should be there. I think the problem with the last of continuity, whatever commissions have come, as you said, like there are four, nearly four commissions have come, you know, and the last two commissions reports, you can say that the commission report is like, is a, is a very strong one. I think it's raised many issues. Idate and the Renke Commission, Renke Commission in 2008 was also raised many issues. So those issues can be effectively uh, 
problem can be solved with the continuation. With, it should be continued. I think problem with the discontinuation, I think, yeah. So, yeah, these are the my suggestions. Yes, 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 thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arthur. Uh, if nobody has any question, then yeah. Yeah. Aditi, uh, I can see Aditi. If no, I think she left. I think Deepali, there yes. are no more questions, so we can conclude the topic. So thank you, thank you, Doctor Vikur Rathod, on behalf of all the like Nomad Liberty Movement and all the organizing committee. Uh, Arvind Giri, just thankful to you for delivering the wonderful session and giving various insights on the, especially on livelihood uh, of the nomadic and, and nearby tribe. This will be definitely very helpful to all the researchers, students, and all the participants, those who are present in today's uh, session, or who, those whosoever, they will see the, uh, this session afterwards also on uh, Facebook. Thank you, thank you, yes. and I'm thank also you so much. to all yes. the, uh, participants. participants thank, you. Yes. thank you so much, Dr. Arthur, for accepting this invitation. Uh, no, on a very short period of time, but uh, it's it's very uh, nice to hear your no uh, um, session, and I think yes, it, it will be also helpful for all of us, all of who are in the initial phase of their research. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erwin. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Deepali. Thank you, Adi. Yes. Yeah.